Well, hello, and uh, welcome to the Shepherd Talks. Uh, my name is Guy Matthews. I'm the rector of the Good Shepherd Anglican Church, and my special guest this afternoon is Bishop Mark. All right. Well, Bishop, welcome to the Shepherd Talks. Thank you, Guy. It's a delight to be here. Now, you hold a PhD. Uh, you are the Anglican Bishop of the Canberra Goulburn yeah. Diocese. I guess your official title is the Right Reverend Dr. Mark Short. Uh, what do you normally like to be called? I'm fairly relaxed. Mm. I answer to Mark. It's what my mother calls me, so that's absolutely that's fine. But Bishop Mark is fine. Bishop Mark, very good. We can uh, work with that. So... Um, Apart from your official roles mm -hmm. uh, as the bishop, most of us don't know very much about you. Just to get us warmed up, can you share with us uh, one uh, sort of interesting, perhaps fun fact that most of us wouldn't know about yourself? Uh, an interesting fact, I have an ancestor who was the mistress of the last French emperor. Ooh. And uh, I have a photo at home of me standing next to her wax effigy in the foyer of Madame Tussauds in London. Uh, so she actually has an effigy there? Correct, oh, yes. Okay. She tried to run off with the crown jewels and got caught and uh, lost her head, quite literally. Wow, and when was that? 1790-something. Uh, okay, very good. Oh, well, that is interesting, and I guess most of us didn't know that. So... Um, we might sort of journey back a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, can you share with us something about your family of origin? Tell us a little bit about uh, where you grew up, about your family. Thank you. Um, I'm one of uh, two sons. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I have a younger brother who's a school teacher. And we essentially grew up in the western suburbs of Sydney. My father worked for the bank. So during the first five years of our, my life, we moved around quite a bit. But when I was oh. five, he got a job in Sydney. And we settled at a place called Wentworthville, just west of oh, Parramatta. Yes. yes. Uh, that's where I grew up. I spent all of my uh, schooling and my university years uh, the, the, living in there. In those days, uh, that was pretty far west, I imagine, of Sydney, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, these days, it's the demographic centre yes. of, of, of Sydney. But in those days, you were definitely a Westie if you lived out there. Yes. So... Uh, were your parents uh, church folk, um, and they've not had? How did you become a Christian? Yeah, my parents were ch church senders rather than church goers. What I mean by that is they were right at the end of that generation where they would diligently send their children off to Sunday school each week, although they th themselves weren't active participants in the life of a congregation. Right. Uh, so, from a very early age, I was sent to Sunday school. What, what kind of church? Was it an Anglican it, church? Yeah, Bishop it was Mark? A, a local Anglican church at, at Wentworthville, St Paul's R Wendy. Right. And do you remember a time that you um, were born again, I guess? Or was it just something that you grew into over the years? Yeah, I, I dropped out of church involvement uh, early in my teenage years. Mm. I, um, not in any sense of... I guess, um, consciously rejecting the idea that the Christian faith might be true. I just didn't see what implications it had for me. Yes. Uh, around that time, I got a scholarship to um, attend uh, an Anglican school um, elsewhere in Sydney. Okay. St Andrews Cathedral School. Yes, all right. And when I was at uh, St Andrews, I got to see and experience uh, the care and teaching and ministry of some Christian teachers there. Right. And, and their faith really made uh, an impact on me. I saw that for them, uh, it was more than simply uh, an item to be ticked off on a CV in order yes. to get employment. Yeah. Their relationship with Jesus was something that had transformed the way they, they lived and the way they talked and the priorities right. they set. Right. Yeah. The very what? fact that they were willing to spend time uh, with 14-year-old boys was a sign of that. Even as a 14-year-old boy myself, I implicitly realised that was the case. Yeah, so, so they, were, they, they had permission, if you like, to, to talk openly about their faith at, at that school? or Yeah, they did. Um, and they were also involved in uh, leading a, a Christian lunchtime group mm. uh, that met at the school. Okay. And it was particularly through um, becoming involved in that lunchtime group mm. and studying the Bible with my peers mm. uh, in the company of these teachers mm. that I came to understand that Jesus is not simply 
a figure from ancient history. Yes. Uh, that he was a, a living Lord and Saviour and that I needed to make a personal response to who he was and what he'd done for me. Yes. And, uh, and then you were involved in your local church uh, back home or, or were you mainly kind of connected through the school um, Christian life? Yeah, after, after coming to a, a, a living faith, um, I reconnected with um, my local church. I was confirmed mm. at the age of 15, which, which was a, yep. a significant milestone for me because it was an opportunity to you know, publicly affirm that I'm mm. you know, committed to, to following Jesus as my Lord and Saviour. Mm. And, and so uh, church continued to be an important part of my life as, as well. Very good. So uh, now you left school, uh, well, I assume you left school, and uh, you went off to study at university straight after school. Is uh, that right? Yes. Or, uh, so I did two things after I left school. So mm. I'd always been keen to get into the media industry. So mm. uh, my first full-time job was as a copy person at News Limited, which is the company owned by Rupert Murdoch. Right. A right. copy person is some, essentially someone who does tasks and chores for journalists okay. in the hope that one day uh, the favour of the proprietor will fall on them and they'll ascend to the rank of being a, a journalist themselves. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I didn't become a, a journalist at News Limited. I'd actually um, we got a cadetship with uh, their competitors, Fairfax, uh, right. with the City Morning Herald. Right. Um, so... For four years, I was both working in the media, but also studying part-time at university. Right. In, uh, which university was that? So, I was studying uh, economics and industrial relations at the University of New South Wales. Right. And, and why did you choose economics and industrial... Res or what was it? Industrial... The relations. Relations. Yes, we yeah. had industrial relations in those days. I think it's yes. subsequently been taken over by human resource management okay, and other right, things. Okay, right. There you go. I was looking for a field of study that would, I guess, equip me to um, engage with mm. significant issues in the life of society and mm. culture and, mm. um, you know, that would actually equip me with the kind of skills and background that would help me be a journalist. Um, right. And economics and industrial relations seemed, you know, disciplines are very concrete that related to, you know, right. yeah. context of society in a, in a very obvious way. And so uh, you completed your studies, and then what, what work life did you uh, engage with after mm -hmm. that? So after four years of um, combining full-time work with part-time study, I uh, then went to finish off my degree full-time. So mm -hmm. I had two years of full-time study mm -hmm. uh, while doing some freelance um, journalism. Uh, during that time, um, I uh, picked up a, a cadetship in the Commonwealth Public Service in the Department of Industrial Relations, as it was then. Right, OK, yes. So that's how the connection with Canberra first developed. Right, so you moved to Canberra um, for that work. That's okay. correct, yes. And um, now what about, uh, you're married to Monica. Yes, I am. Uh, where did Monica, when did Monica come into the scene, Mark? OK, so Monica also uh, attended the University of New South Wales, where yes. she was studying social work. Right. Uh, we first met at a uh, media conference for the Christian group at right. the University of okay. New South Wales, but right. uh, we didn't start going out at that stage. Um, no. Can you remember what year that was? It would have been somewhere around, here we go, uh, maybe, maybe 1987 or 88. Okay, right. Because hmm. I think I might have known your wife at to the university, and I'm trying to work out how and when, but yeah, that yeah, so makes that, that, sense. I would have I've been around then. Yeah. yeah. So we, 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 we touched base then. Um, anyway, the next time we caught up was, in fact, in Canberra. So this was uh, prior to our final years of study. She was doing a work placement at a mental health service in Canberra. I was right. doing a work placement at the Department of Industrial Relations, and on Sunday... We both went along to, to church right. and uh, found ourselves catching up with each other uh, over supper afterwards. Very good. And, uh, and the relationship developed from there. It, it did indeed. So when were you married? Can you remember that year, Mark? I can't remember. 20th of <laughs> July, 1991. Okay, very good.
1991. Um, now, you then, uh, at some stage, um, I guess, had a change of, of career, if you like. Yeah. Um, you, you went off to more theological mm -hmm. college to study theology. Mm -hmm. um, uh, why did you choose to do that? What led to that? Yeah. When we were here in Canberra, as well as um, being involved in our work lives, Monica and I um, were involved in a, a local Anglican church, mm -hmm. uh, both in terms of benefiting from the, the ministry and teaching in that church, but also being involved in other ways, for example, leading a, a young adults group. And as we did that, we could see the benefit of doing um, some additional training yeah. in, in Bible and theology to equip us for ongoing yeah. ministry. Our initial idea was that we'd um, take leave of absence from our jobs in the public service, go and study for a year at, at college in Sydney, and then come back and continue to work um, in the public right. service okay. while also being involved in our, our local uh, congregation. Things didn't work out that way. <laughs> no, no. The, the minister of our church at the time encouraged me to say to think carefully about, um, you know, with the opportunity that I had before me, whether under God it might be um, wise to consider the possibility of moving into, you know, focused Christian ministry mm. in, a, in a full-time way. Um, so that that and so you you. You went to more college mm. initially for one year, initially for one year, and then stayed on and completed four years. I guess uh, we, we, I did three years at more college, right. and then came back to Canberra and did some further study down here. Okay, uh, and you offered yourself for ordination in the Anglican Church. In fact, Canberra Goulburn Diocese, as I understand it. That's correct. Yes. Right, and obviously got through the interviews all right. Oh, well, they were very they, they were very gracious as they continue to be. Okay, that's good. Um, so once you were ordained, uh, where did you go? Um, where did you serve initially? Yeah, our, our first um, place of ministry after finishing college was at uh, Tamora in the northwest of our diocese. Right. A, a rural community of around 4,500 people. Right. And As the rector? As, as an assistant. As yeah. assistant, yeah. yeah. And uh, we learned all kinds of things there. Um, yeah. As I mentioned, Monica and I both had... Uh, essentially growing up in the western suburbs of Sydney. Yes. Uh, so there was lots that we had to learn about rural life, rural life and folk there were very gracious and patient in helping us uh, understand what life was like for them. Oh, good. Have you been back to tomorrow, Mark, as a bishop? And uh, yeah. do they remember you? Uh, yeah, I was back there last year doing a teaching weekend and it was great to catch up with people that we'd known then and see yes. that they're continuing to go on serving the Lord and, and being part of that, that church. Terrific. Now, as I understand it, uh, from Tamora, you went off to um, study for a PhD, is that right? Yeah, we spent three years in uh, the northeast of England at Durham, where yeah. I was doing some study in Old Testament. So, so what, uh, what led to that? I mean, why did you decide uh, to take that path? Yeah, uh, it wasn't something we had necessarily expected or planned for. Um, in God's providence, there was a, a scholarship that became available just at the time I was coming to the end of uh, my ministry appointment. Right, is that the Lucas Tooth Scholarship? The Lucas You're Tooth. You're a Lucas Tooth Scholar, there you Yes, are. Uh, a, a gentleman called Baronet Tooth. Uh, some of you will recognise his name from Tooth Brewery. Yes, yeah. Uh, many years ago endowed a scholarship to um, provide opportunities for further theological education. Right. For what he called colonial clergy. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Uh, to uh, up the ante in the colonies, I guess, and originally, I don't know. Oh, I think the, the terms of the original deed were to expose them to a broader culture. Okay, there you are. So you were exposed to a broader culture at Durham, is Correct, that right? Yeah. University of Durham. What was the topic of your PhD? So I was looking at the Passover, particularly in the mm -hmm. Old Testament, and what it teaches us about memory, and in particular, how communities remember. Right, okay. So, uh, now, did you have children at this stage? I think you've got uh, two children. Yeah, we have two yeah. sons, uh, Andrew and Matthew. Yes, were uh, Who they? we're both very proud of. Yeah, when we went over to England, um, Matthew was two and Andrew right. was five. So, Andrew has some vague memories of our time in England, but 
Matthew, yes. none at all. Right, okay. So you finished up, uh, you came back to C uh, Canberra Goulburn, mm -hmm. um, a rector of South Wagga or Turvey Park as it was then. That's correct, um, mm -hmm. in, in, in Wagga Wagga. Um, so, uh, you mm -hmm. know, a substantial regional city on the, the western edge of our diocese. Right. And uh, at the time, we also had a partnership with the parish of Tarkata. So I was also um, ministering in that parish as well. Right, okay. Had you thought of going into academia uh, armed with a PhD or, or had you always wanted to get back into parish life? I, I think my heart was to, to go back to parish life. Mm. Um, my, my PhD was very much focused on how, as I said, the Passover in particular, how that story of God's deliverance of, of his people shapes the life of a community of faith. Mm. And, and, and so, you know, continuing to serve within the context of a, of a local church fitted in nicely with that. It, it yes. felt like a, an ongoing expression of what I'd learnt through the PhD experience rather than a departure from it. Right, very good. Now, um, you, you spent some years at uh, South Wagga mm -hmm. and then uh, called to be the director of the Bush Church Aid, mm -hmm. uh, BCA. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and that's where you served for a good number of years. What, what led you to uh, accept that um, invitation? Yeah, as, as I mentioned, um, Wagga was, is a significant regional city, mm. uh, but when I was there, we, I was also involved in ministering at, at Takata, which is a, a smaller rural community of mm. around 300 people on the Hume right. Highway. Right. And um, had also been involved in supporting ministry uh, in other parishes and communities on that side of the diocese. So, yeah, right back to our time at Tamora, God had planted in our hearts uh, a, a passion for his work in, in the bush. Yes. Uh, we could see both um, the opportunities of um, reaching out to people with the good news of Jesus, but also some of the challenges of resourcing ministry in places that don't have access to the same scope, I guess, of human and financial resources that you might have in a larger city. So um, BCA, the Bush Church Aid Society, is committed to sending and supporting people mm. to minister in the bush, so in God's and providence. And all over Australia. Yeah, all over Australia. Yeah. yeah, when we were there, we had people serving you know, all mm. the way from Darwin in the north, mm. Tasmania in the south, mm. Exmouth in the west, and... Mm as far as Norfolk Island to the east. And did you get to travel to all these places? Because I, I guess you, you're based in Sydney. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, we, we do get to travel to all kinds of mm. beautiful parts of God's creation, mm. which was a real privilege and blessing. Mm. And see you know, both some um, wonderful uh, parts of creation, but also some great examples of people serving faithfully right. in, in challenging locations. Right. Um, so, uh, how long were you with BCA? Uh, just under eight years. Okay. Um, then, uh, then, I don't know how it worked, but uh, the, uh, the role of uh, Bishop of Canberra Goulburn Diocese yeah. uh, must have came onto your horizon at some stage. Um, uh, and obviously, uh, that uh, process took mm. some time. Now, you have been serving as a bishop for a little over a year. I think it was 6th of April Correct. last so, year so you were just consecrated. Over, just over 12 months. Right. And um, so what does a bishop do? What have you been doing in the last year, Mark? All, all kinds of things. Uh, so a, a bishop is, is, is fundamentally a pastor and teacher. In mm. other words, someone who seeks to shepherd the people of God uh, and does so by teaching the, the word of God. Um, yeah. In that sense, the, a bishop is no different from, um, for example, the rector of, uh, of a local parish. Yes. Uh, having said that, uh, a bishop also has some particular responsibilities in res related to the oversight of a diocese, which is a group of parishes yep. and other ministries. Yep. Uh, and, and that involves uh, particularly uh, the selection and ordination of people who God might be calling to to serve in particular ministries, doing that in company with others. Um, it also involves um, building connections between different ministries, whether we're talking about parish ministries or schools or, or welfare ministry through an agency like Anglicare, mm. and building a sense of common vision as we seek to serve Jesus together. Right. So uh, now you, you, you obviously have a... Um 
a, a wide uh, knowledge of the diocese and probably growing all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm sure your heart is well and truly with this diocese mm -hmm. and a passion for it. Can you tell us, uh, in your view, what are some of the unique uh, distinctives of, of mm. uh, the Canberra Goulburn Diocese as, a, as an Anglican diocese in Australia, I guess? Yeah, thank you, Guy. I guess um, rather than unique, I have to say characteristic okay, because, yeah. you know, some of what I'm about to say, you could say, well, that applies in some sense to other dioceses as well. Yeah. But let me share what I think are some of the particular defining characteristics of, of this diocese. One is just the... Um, the diversity of ministry and mission opportunities that we have. Mm. Uh, most Anglican dioceses in Australia are primarily city-based or primarily rural-based. Mm. Um, whereas um, Canberra Goulburn, you couldn't say that. We, of course, have in the heart of our, our diocese the, the city of Canberra, the capital city of our yep. nation. Yep. Uh, but we also have uh, significant uh, rural communities to the west and north. Uh, we also have the coastal community stretching all the way from Batemans Bay in the north to Eden in the south. Mm. And while, of course, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is fundamentally the same wherever we happen to be ministering, uh, there are wonderful opportunities to uh, craft and communicate that gospel message in a way that connects with people, whether we're talking about you know, public servants with a tertiary education or farmers or people mm, mm. who are retired or seeking an alternative lifestyle. So I love the fact that we have such a, a diversity of opportunities to reach out with the good news of Jesus. So I, I guess that in some ways complicates your ministry as a bishop because you're having to keep changing hats from a, a rural bishop to a city bishop. Yeah. Or does that, uh, is that something you, you're conscious of, uh, very much uh, kind of trying to work out what's appropriate for the particular context of the churches. Yeah, I, I, that's certainly part of it. One of the, the lessons I learned when I began ministering in Tamora is that you need to understand, for example, when to pray for rain. Okay. You know, if, if you're a farmer there in the congregation and your minister up the front is praying for rain and it happens to be harvest time, yes. <laughs> you're probably you know, despairing at their lack of empathy, right, or okay. if not actually sort of actively praying that God would delay any answer. Yes. Uh, so there is some of that. Um, yeah. But one of the great opportunities, it means that there's opportunities for partnership to develop between churches in quite different communities. Sure. So, you know, in this current COVID-19 season, I've heard, for example, stories of uh, churches like Good Shepherd that are, uh, relatively speaking, um, larger and well-resourced in mm, terms mm. of technological expertise, mm. partnering with churches in smaller communities and helping them uh, establish new ways of doing ministry so they too can reach out uh, to yes. their particular community. So we'll, we'll get on to the coronavirus mm. uh, issues in just a little while. Um, but uh, looking ahead, um, uh, what's your thinking for, in a broad sense, the, 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 um, the health of the Anglican Church, say, in this diocese? Mm. A lot of people... And we hear lots of news, I guess, of, of uh, falling numbers mm. and uh, difficulties around church life. Uh, what, what, are you optimistic, pessimistic, realistic? What do you think, Mark? Uh, one, of my Mark? one of my favorite quotes is from uh, a great uh, missionary bishop, uh, Leslie Newbigin, who said, I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. In right. other words, Christian hope is not a matter of temperament, whether you happen to be yep. a glass half full or glass half empty mm -hmm. kind of person. Mm. It's, it's taking our stance, I guess, on what God has done for us in the Lord Jesus. Yes. Um, so, so to come back to your question about the, the future of the Anglican Church, yeah, you know, I guess you could try and answer a question like that sociologically. You could, you know, plot attendance numbers over a particular period and then extrapolate into the future and make some prediction about mm. you know, how many people will be in Anglican churches uh, you know, in 25 years' time. And now, no doubt there's a certain validity in that. Um, but I find it more helpful to begin to answer the question theologically. Right. So, you know, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, I will build my church. Yes. So Jesus is committed to building his church. He hasn't given up on that job description for the last 2,000 years. He's been building his church as the gospel is proclaimed, as people come to trust in the Lord Jesus, yeah. as communities of faith are established. 
And while that doesn't give us a particular promise for the future of the Anglican Church or indeed any other denominational expression, what it does say to me is that if we give ourselves to Jesus' agenda and if we align ourselves with his priorities, Mm -hmm. then we do have a future because his mission has a future. So, Bishop Mark, um, in light of that, Mm. uh, do you have a vision for the diocese for the next five, ten years, uh, something that you might like to share? Yeah, at at last year's Synod, I talked uh, about the theme uh, Across the Divide, engaging a world of difference with the love and truth of Jesus. I say a world of difference because we live at a time where we're increasingly aware that we're a diverse and sometimes a fragmented society. You know, just go onto Facebook and you can soon become very aware of that. And precisely because we live in such a diverse and fragmented society, it's easy for all of us, Christians included, to retreat into our own echo chambers and not seek to engage with people who see the world differently from we do. Uh, The gospel of Jesus compels us to reach out with his gospel in words and through acts of service to people who, are, who do see the world differently. And my hope and prayer that is that we, both as individuals and as ministry units in this diocese, mm. will have an increasing confidence in the gospel of the Lord Jesus that will give us a willingness to go the extra mile, um, to open up conversations with people who may not see the world as we do, uh, to speak with our neighbours, to establish new ways of doing church so that uh, many more people will have the opportunity that we've had to encounter um, life and hope in Jesus. Right, okay, well, thank you. Now, I'd like to uh, move on to the specific uh, Mm. time we're in, the coronavirus Mm. era, whatever we might like to call it, COVID era, and uh, obviously the whole world is is being uh, shaken somewhat by this Um, Can you share some things of how the diocese is responding uh, to the crisis that we're in? Yeah, thank you, Guy. And yeah, it it is a time both of challenge and opportunity. We recognise that this is a very difficult time for very many people, whether because of the impact on people's health or because of the impact on people's uh, job and economic situation. And I certainly don't want to minimise any of that. Having said that, it's also a season of opportunity. Um, I was listening to a podcast recently that said that we in the West have moved from a society which is all about our wants to a society where we've had to think about our needs. You know, there's nothing quite like, you know, having to plan when and where to buy toilet paper to make you realise that, you know, life is not as straightforward as you might have assumed it to be. So what's happening in the diocese? Well, one of the really exciting things that is happening is that local churches are finding some very creative ways both to keep connected with each other and to reach out uh, to their broader community. They're doing that through um, online church, whether that's live streaming or using video conferencing. Uh, They're doing that as they keep in touch with people either uh, online or through telephone calls or sending notes. Uh, but they're also uh, reaching out to people who are not yet part of the community of faith. And I hear some wonderful stories of how, in this very season, uh, people who weren't part of the church when it gathered together physically have taken that opportunity uh, to connect with what's happening in different ways. As a diocese, we're seeking to to share expertise um, across our different parishes and ministry units, so we have a a genuine sense of partnership. So we're working at getting communication out there, making sure that, for example, people are informed about the latest public health requirements and how that impacts on how we do church, um, giving people opportunities to connect with uh, webinars about the practicalities of doing church through Zoom. And I would hope also setting um, a broader theological framework that helps us think, what does faithfulness look like in a season like this? Um, At a very practical level, uh, at our diocesan office, uh, we've been working to make sure that parishes, ministry units and other agencies are able to access whatever government support they're eligible Mm. for to ensure that um, people continue to be paid. And we're also beginning to think about what the next stage of the journey might look like. 
Firstly, what, what, what can we learn from this season? Mm. You know, what new skills have we developed? What new insights have we gained that we actually need to carry forward with us into the next stage of life, whatever that looks like? And secondly, how, as in, in, in time I trust will be the case as various restrictions are, are gradually removed, how can we think carefully and strategically about what it means to care for people as we move through those mm. different stages? I, I think uh, that's certainly one of the exciting things coming out of this, for looking ahead beyond uh, social distancing, when we mm. can meet together what we've learnt mm. and uh, how we can better utilise uh, modern technology and the internet and goodness knows what other great things people have been doing for, for the gospel. Yeah, you know, at a diocesan level, um, in a couple of weeks' time, we've got our annual clergy conference. Normally, of course, we do that face-to-face. -face. This year, it will happen through Zoom, but one of the opportunities that's opened up is to draw in speakers from anywhere and everywhere. So we've got yeah. you know, speakers who will be joining us from the other side of the world. Terrific. And, and so we're asking the question, uh, how can we use technology to provide ongoing um, training and equipping opportunities, not just for the clergy, but for other folk in our diocese. So for your own personal family life with uh, you mm. and Monica, I think your boys have left home, is that right? Your well, we, kind of left, we sort of left them. <laughs> okay, yes. So uh, um, how, how, is your, how are you keeping encouraged and uh, living your life, uh, I guess, without so much uh, going to the office every day or yeah, different so churches, doing, you're not doing confirmations and the like. Now. No, 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 we're doing different things. So uh, we're, um, we, we continue to be involved in our, our local church that we attend when I'm not on the, the road, as it were, mm -hmm. on and Anglican Church. Um, we're also using technology to keep up, keep in touch with family members. So um, we have a, a weekly um, Zoom dinner or Zoom get-together with our, our boys and their girlfriends. Um, we're also looking for intentional ways to be engaged in the life of our local community. So uh, once a week we're volunteering at a, a local food bank ministry and we've also, in partnership with others, began to do some work on uh, beautifying a local park and that's oh, right. been a really great opportunity. Mm, mm. And when life gets all a bit complicated, we have our favourite escape, which is the local duck pond. I was going to say the local dog. Don't you have a dog oh, as we well? Have, yeah, we have Swifty, our dog as well. Yes, okay. That's right, so he keeps us company. Right. And the three of us, there's a, a, a duck pond around um, the corner from us. And we go down there and, and check what the ducks are up to. And they seem <laughs> remarkably unperturbed yes. by the latest you know, ha, you know, public health yeah. pronouncements. And it's just a, you know... In the Gospels, Jesus encourages us to consider the lilies of the field and the Indeed. birds of the air and see how God provides for them. And we just find that a, a great way of being reminded that God is sovereign and gracious and that in this season of so much that's caught us by surprise, God isn't caught by surprise. So uh, and uh, this sort of leads into uh, this question for your, your encouragement or words to those who may be uh, finding it particularly stressful, difficult mm. times, I'm sure many, many people are. Uh, have you got particular words <laughs> or encouragement, advice that you would like to share? Um, I guess they, they would be uh, brothers and sisters in Christ who are probably watching us now. Mm. Uh, what would you like to say? I'd say, remember that the risen Lord Jesus is with you. Um, yeah. Jesus couldn't be confined to a tomb. He emerged from the tomb victorious over the forces of sin and death and chaos and everything that threatens us. You know, we're reminded in Romans that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. And that includes coronavirus. That includes economic uncertainty. That includes physical distancing. Um, that wherever we are, if we belong to Jesus through faith in him and all that he's done for us, we have the assurance that he is present with us by his spirit. So there's, there's never a challenge that the Christian has to face alone. Uh, whatever life brings us, we know that we encounter it knowing that the risen Lord Jesus, the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth, is there with us. Well, Bishop Mark, that seems like a very appropriate place to finish. So uh, I thank you for coming along to uh, Good Shepherd this afternoon. And uh, we pray that God will continue to bless you and your family and indeed uh, all of us and our churches. Uh, thank you.
Thank you, Guy, and I continue to pray that God blesses the ministry of God's people in, in this place and works in and through you for his glory. Indeed.